All right, this is um, another Chromecast on communities that I have lived in. Um, and this one is called, believe it or not, the Hotel Idlewild. That's exactly what it was. Okay, it starts in, uh, let's see, which year was it? I was 26 years old, 25 years old, I think. I was in feeling increasingly restive in my marriage, my first marriage. I had two little boys, um, and I, for the first time, disobeyed my husband and went to this place that this my friend, my new friend Sylvia, had told me about called the Hotel Idlewild in Manomet, Massachusetts. We were in Cambridge at the time. It was like an hour south uh, near, the, near the Cape. And... Um, and she had done it the year before, too. And the year before, they'd had this guru. And so there were like 30 people, 30 adults, and like 10 kids, and a guru. And this guru would gather them together twice a week. And she said to me, this time we're going to get rid of the guru. I just know we are. And so I went. I actually disobeyed my husband, took the children, went down there to the Hotel Idlewild. We have pictures of it up here including a picture of the um, staircase that we used to get down from the cliff to the beach. It was a dr very dramatic spot. And the people that were there were mostly uh, people in their 20s, in graduate students, in various area universities, some with kids, some without. Um, we were all reading things like the Yaki Way of Knowledge, you know, Don Juan's book. Um, that was one of the, you know, that was the, the beginning of the, of the 60s ferment, even though the 60s had been going. It was still the beginning of our really waking up to that. But I was still a very fearful wife and mother, a good student and so forth, but still very fear-based. Fear uh, and so to take this radical step of going to the Hotel Idlewild with Sylvia, whom I roomed next to, they have bathrooms in the middle, uh, was like astonishing for me. Uh, my husband would come down on weekends and pose in his in his wetsuit, you know, as he went out and, and fish for whatever, you know, snorkel for whatever. And he felt very uncomfortable there. Um, I, I felt uncomfortable too. But for me, it was this incredible need. I didn't even know what the need was. And if you saw my room then that first year, my room was just as I had found it with an army blanket on the bed, uh, no furniture except for a dresser uh, and the bed and a lamp, and that was it. And all I put in that room that year, that summer, was one novel. I was reading Nicholas and Alexandria, which is a huge novel. I was reading that all summer, and my hairbrush. I had very long, wonderful hair. And that's it. I mean, I, it was like a it was like um, like nobody lived there. It was like nobody lived there. And I did feel like nobody. It was a very strange feeling. I was no longer the good wife mother uh, anymore. I knew that, but I didn't know what I was, and I wasn't anything yet. Meanwhile, Sylvia next door was a full-fledged hippie, and she had, you know, undulating, uh, uh, tie-dyed uh, blanket tied to her, to her, ceiling. She had Bob Dylan on the on the radio all the time or on the phonograph all the time. She she was, you know, constantly seducing men and so forth. And I was just this monkish, nunnish person in this room wondering, you know, what am I doing here? This is very scary and I've got to do it. And why it's important is to say that this was the scene of my awakening to myself. This is the scene that prepared me for my awakening to myself. It was a very anarchistic com community, commune, really commune. Uh, it had, it was, um, we had one meeting a week, that's all, and uh, that meeting was basically set up by the mothers, the mothers who would have a meeting before the meeting, because we were the ones that had the children, and we wanted the children to be able to run free, but we needed to make sure they were protected. So we'd set up the agenda for the meetings, and then the meetings would involve all the adults. Um, and so it was like probably 20 kids and uh, maybe 30 adults, I don't know, something like that. Uh, it was two sto three stories, uh, two of them bedrooms, and the other a main floor with a giant dance room, which is going to become important as time goes on, and a beautiful 
big old commercial kitchen and a dining room. That was, that was it. That's what the Hotel Idlewell consisted of, plus porches all around, which was interesting because the hippies, and I was a, a new fledgling hippie, I had smoked a little dope and that's about it, uh, we'd all sit out on the porch um, in the evenings and we'd, um, you know, watch the station wagons roll by with the suburban kids and, you know, the, the parents and their kids and they're looking at these hippies like, who are they, you know, and we're going, who are you? And so it was definitely the Hotel Idle Wild. We were the Idle Wild during that summer. Uh, and they were. I was still wondering who I was. I was still feeling like a, um, a cipher. Uh, in fact, I can remember one time down on the beach, lying there with everybody else in suits, in our swimming suits, lying on blankets. Everybody was having this very um, earnest conversation. I don't remember what about, probably some Doris Lessing book or something like that, or maybe it was the Don Juan book. But I would sit there and, and marvel at how they could speak without thinking, that their, their, their words just came out of them. And for me, at that point in my life, in order to say anything, I had to prepare it in advance. I had to prepare the sentence that I was going to say out loud in my mind before I said it. So that's how inhibited I was. And I remember thinking, I am so different than them. They, they are able to be completely free, and I am completely not free. And I was very, very aware of that. Um, and it was really, really... Um, uh, you know, a very liminal time for me. I was, no, I was no, I was no longer who I used to be, and I didn't know who I was going to become. Uh, on Saturday nights, instead of having the guru, which we got rid of very soon, very early on, I think I said, uh, we had these dance events every single Saturday night, and we'd have strobe lights, and you know, it was the Doors and the Stones and all that music that became, you know, iconic that still is for the, the kids that live with me now that are in their 20s. Uh, you know, it's the iconic music is the music of the 60s that we were inside of. And uh, that's where I started to free myself up was on the dance floor, just by myself, just dancing by myself, just, just, just letting go of all the habits and strictures that I had learned over all those years. I just started to just move with the music and completely let go of who I had been. Not worried so much about what people would think of me because everybody was doing that. Everybody was free. Everybody was doing their own thing. Nobody cared what I was doing. So I could actually have the freedom to actually express myself. And it was an incredibly healing place for me in that way. I can remember one other, one other uh, scene from that summer that comes to me. And I was um, going down into the dining room. It was, um, the, well, there's a couple, couple of them I could tell you about. Uh, I, it was um, going to eat. It was night. It was dinner. We had prepared a meal. There were probably 100 people there because on the weekends, everybody's friends came down from Boston to see us and to be on the beach with us. It was quite an opportunity was, to learn how to organize a meal, especially when a bunch of anarchists were doing it. Uh, what we did do is we had the women would be the main cooks because we knew how to cook and the men did not at that point. And we'd also be uh, paired with a man for doing the dishes because we knew how to do the dishes and they had never learned. So, you know, we were, we were beginning the whole process of equalizing household tasks um, at the Hotel Idlewild. And uh, so the men were always our apprentices in the kitchen. I remember one other, one other scene that vividly comes to mind is going down there in the early morning now into the kitchen area. And there were all these people like this, you know, sitting there at the tables like, oh man, oh man. People that had been up all night tripping, something I had never done. And I go, who, you know, what is this? I, I, I mean, that was like way too much for me. I would never do anything like that. Okay, so that summer ended. I went back to Cambridge to be with my husband, though feeling more and more restive, of course, have, having had that experience of freedom. And um, then Sylvia says to me, um, say two weeks went by, and she said, let's go down for one final time. We'll close up the place. We'll make sure everything's okay. 
and we'll just stay for the weekend without our kids. And so I said, okay, so, so we did. And so we made ourselves a little meal at one of these big tables. And um, she pulls out of her pocket a tinfoil package and it had two mescaline tabs in it. And she said, mescaline? And I said, it's time. So after we were done, we each took a tab. She went down to the beach. I stayed in the living room and put on the music and I danced and I started and ended up Sufi twirling and I did this all night long until dawn when I mean it was like I went into a trance state until Sylvia came to the door and you know just kind of startled me awake from that trance state I was in so that I would look at that as one of the key moments of the actual change that I went through that changed me uh, completely. Uh, it was a bodily change that then ended up being something so dramatic that I ended up in the hospital with um, peritonitis uh, and almost died. And a voice came to me um, and said, live or die, it's your choice. I might have speak, spoken of this before, but that's another that can be the feature of another story, but the point is that was the first time I heard an inner voice and the first time the voice said something that profound. It was a booming male voice. Live or die, it's your choice. And the next morning I woke up and my belly was flat after a whole week in the hospital of constant intravenous IVs uh, for antibiotics. It was over. It, it, it went down. The, the swelling went down the fever left, I had chosen to live. And I've known ever since then that the body follows the spirit's intent and, uh, and that the, the two are inextricably combined. And that was something that stayed with me forever. Okay, so the next year wore on. I was still like, you know, what am I doing? I don't really know. Um, it's really scary, but, and then finally in April, I told my husband, you know, you've just got to leave. I just can't do this anymore. So he did. And so I took the kids again and went down to Manomet. So now it's my second summer in Manomet. And now I have a room that's down at the end of the hall. I'm no longer yoked to Sylvia. I'm going to have my own life. I'm completely awakened now. I mean, at some level to the fact that I have infinite capacity. I don't even have any idea what it is, but I have capacity that I don't know about and I'm gonna find out. And I ended up uh, in my first love affair since my marriage was at Manomet and it was a very profound love affair uh, where the first, uh, the first time we did LSD together I'd only, I've only done LSD twice in my life. Uh, maybe it was the second time we did it. We did it together both times. Uh, we had um, an amazing experience sexually that put us out into the universe, into the entire universe, and it was just so thrilling. And when we came down, I went into the bathroom, and I was like, oh, my God, that was so amazing. It was like this flood of, of, of fluid was was flowing out of me and it was like something had shifted me completely now and I was very very thrilled by it. I walked back in and my lover Tracy was sitting there huddled on the bed. Oh gosh, oh go get David for me. David was a friend of ours. So I went and got David and David took him downstairs and had him stirring orange juice to bring him back to, to, to reality. And I sat up there with David's uh, lover, Nancy, and I said, he doesn't realize how strong I am. Now, my relationship with him up to this point had been me wanting to have him as my good father, basically. You know, somebody I could lean on, somebody who was stronger, more powerful. And he was distinctly uncomfortable with that uh, way of being, but uh, I really needed it. I really thought that's what it should be. Uh, and so what happened as a result of that acid trip was I go downstairs and I 
say to Tracy, okay, Tracy, you and I are going to go to the beach. And he obediently got up. I mean, he was like a little boy at this point. He obediently got up. I got a blanket and put it around his shoulders, held him as we walked down the stairs, the photograph of which I am going to show you here, 100 steps, 110 steps, something like that, all the way down to the beach. And it was a new moon. There was no, there was no um, light except the stars. And so he was constantly scared. He'd go, well, what's that? What's that over there? I'd say, oh, that's just like a hole with a log thrown over it and a blanket over that. And I was making it up. Every time he'd, he'd be scared of something, I'd make something up to explain it. And you know, the next morning, I found out that all my explanations were true. I was seeing it, but I didn't even know I was seeing it. Okay, so we lie down on the sand, on blankets, and we lie down, and he couldn't do it. It was like it made him nauseated to look at the sky, to look at the stars. So he went over on his stomach, and he was just like huddled, and I was like, going out into the universe. I was like thrilled. It was like complete shift in our relationship to one another where now I was the strong one. Now I was the adventurer and he was like this lost little boy. And that went on all night until morning when something shifted again. And this and the morning was when the, the the tide was going out very, very slowly. It was a very shallow beach. So it would go very, very slowly out, way, way out, like out like a quarter of a mile. And it was all the rivulets that you could see coming from the water. I mean, and the sun rising at the same time. It was like this extraordinary moment of, of miracle. It felt very miraculous. And we got up, the two of us got up, and now something had shifted again so that we were equals. Finally, we were equals. And we held hand and walked towards the water, walked towards the rising sun. And I should have known, but of course I did not, that that was the perfection and the end, the real true end of that relationship. I had come of age during that summer, and I'd also had come of age in terms of relationship, but it didn't mean that relationship was supposed to continue. So I look at those two summers, both in this anarchistic community, which had minimal rules and had everybody there being very free and allowing each other to be who we really were, as an incredible place, an incredible community for me to come into who, I didn't know who I was yet, but I knew that I was going to, to follow my path, whatever it was. And that next morning, that, that same morning, I went into Tracy's room and I picked up a book there that he had told me I should read. My teacher had told me, never read this, this philosopher. His name is Ludwig Wittgenstein. He said, never read him because he's confused. And besides, my teacher said, he's a subclinical schizophrenic. And so of course I was a good student until this moment and I didn't read him until I took that book in my room and I started reading it reverently, page by page by page. I read it all day long. And at the end, Tracy comes into the room and he says, and Tracy, by the way, was a philosophy professor. He comes into the room and he says to me, well, and I, I looked at him and I said, this book is true, but I don't know what it means. And then I thought to myself, how can I say that? I have to know what something means before I know whether it's true or not. And the whole next year, I unpacked that statement. How could I know that something's true without knowing what it means? And that led me to excavate the foundations of the common sense that philosophy uses and that Western scientific culture has used ever since Descartes and probably before then. So I, I started my path then of becoming a philosopher basically 
a very, um, not the usual kind of philosopher, but a philosopher nonetheless. And it started with an LSD trip. And it started with Tracy saying, you should read this. And it started with my teacher saying, don't you ever read this. I went to see my teacher very soon afterwards, and I said to him, well, I've read Wittgenstein. And he looked up, and he said, oh? And I said, yes. And he's confused. But his confusion is important. And my teacher said, ah, you may read this.